K.S. Sharma, the secretary of the Rotary Club of Hyderabad and also your MC for this beautiful event. I invite Rotarian President Roy Joseph to call the meeting to order. I call the meeting to order. Thank you, President. May I invite our Vocational Service Director <coughs> Rotarian Sukanya Baba to read the four-way test. Rotary is the four-way test of the things that we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Rotarian Sukanya Baba. I request Rotarian past president, D.K. Raju, to give the thought of the day. Yeah, good evening. Uh, the thought of the uh, day. The cure for bad politics is the same as the cure for tuberculosis. It's living in the open, Woodrow Wilson, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Raju. I request uh, Rotarian President Roy Joseph to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Sharmaji. A warm good evening to all of you. I welcome uh, uh, the executive chairman of LV Prasad I Institute, Dr. Prashant Gurk, uh, Director Merle Fernandez, Dr. Bal Subramanian, Dr. Gian Raugaru, uh, my friend uh, Mavir, who has helped us with all this arrangement, my fellow Rotarians, aunts, and guests. It gives me joy to be in this great institution and to participate in the Dr. Rustum Ranji Memorial Lecture Program. This is a flagship event of Rotary Club of Hyderabad. There is a deep connection between your institution and my club. Dr. Rustum Ranji, on whose name this award is instituted, was a keen Rotarian besides being a charter member of the oldest club of Hyderabad, which is my club. He was a legend of our club and a passionate, uh, very passionate towards service, particularly towards eye care. The awardee for this year is a renowned scientist and uh, from a prestigious organization, Dr. Vinay Kumar. I thank him for accepting this award and I take pleasure in inv inviting you, sir. Thank you. I thank the award committee of LV Prasad and the entire team who has organized this wonderful evening. I thank you all and welcome you all once again. Thank you, Sharmaji. Thank you, President. <coughs> I take great pressure in inviting uh, Dr. Merle Fernandez, the director of LV Prasad I Institute, to make a presentation on this great and unique institution and on its public health initiatives. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
So, um, I'm going to try not to say the same stuff that I always do, okay? So, I hope I'm able to achieve that. So, when you look at these pictures, what strikes you? These are some wonderful photographs of some eyes with some pathology. And, uh, yeah, they could be seen anywhere in, our, in one of the OPDs or the outpatient department in this hospital. Or maybe in Bhubaneswar, Vishakapatnam or um, Vijayawada. But actually, that's not the case. These were taken in Ponduru, Raidurgam, Navipet, Kankipadu. And these are our vision centers. And they were taken by some of our vision technicians with the help of indigenously developed uh, you know, equipments that we have. Um, what you see here is a field test being done by one of the vision technicians. We have an indigenously developed uh, fundus camera known as a forus with which the fundus photographs, that is a picture of the retina was taken. And this is a screening tool for refractive error called the FOFO, which is used for screening for refractive errors out in the community. So this kind of uh, evaluation and screening that's being done, um, how did this all begin? So it all started uh, several years ago when Dr. Rao returned from the US and decided to set up the center here in Hyderabad that initially started as a two-story building and then it grew, became a six-story building and then it grew further and became these two buildings that we see here today. But that was not all. Somewhere along the way, they conducted the Andhra Pradesh Eye Disease Study and found out that the, one of the major causes of visual impairment was refractive error. That is, people could not see well because they did not have glasses. And such a simple thing as the inability of access to eye care and not having glasses was kind of astounding because it meant that people are not able to access eye care. So how did, they, how did we solve that problem? By setting up 22 secondary centers, that's the number established till date. These secondary centers are located in small towns where there's usually no ophthalmologist. And along with those centers, along, somewhere down the line, we set up these tertiary centers, which are in the three cities that I mentioned earlier. And this gave rise to the LVP Eye Health Pyramidal Model. So this pyramidal model actually comprises of vision guardians who are right at the base. They're volunteers who go out into the community. They will screen and they will identify people who have eye problems. They will ask them to visit our vision centers, which are manned by vision technicians. Usually we try and source, them, uh, source these people from the local area itself, thereby empowering them, giving them job opportunities. And they're past 12th standard. They've been trained by us, and they go out into the community. They're able to identify people who have problems with their vision, correct that. They're able to refer people who don't have vision that can be corrected fully, and these go to the next level, that is a secondary center, where we have an ophthalmologist who mans a secondary center. And then more complex problems would get referred to the center of excellence or the tertiary centers, which are in the metro cities. And so this pyramidal model actually helped us to screen eye disorders from basic problems to the management of complex diseases. And uh, it was made in such a way that eye care became appropriate, was appropriate, it was available, it was affordable, it was accessible. We have a system where we are able to treat poor patients absolutely free of cost, and we are able to treat them for all kinds of conditions, regardless of how complex they are, without compromising quality. And we are also able to marry these two philosophies of excellence with equity, where we try to do the best or provide the best kind of care for all these patients, regardless of their background. So what I spoke to you of was a pyramidal model which seemed to be from base upwards. But then if uh, the mountain cannot go to Muhammad, then Muhammad should go to the mountain, or maybe the other way around, anyway. So this old lady is 94 years old. She's from Kapileshwarpuram and she had, could not access eye care. She was a high-risk case for cataract surgery, and so therefore one of the faculty from the tertiary centers traveled to Kapileshwar Puram, did her cataract surgery there, and restored her vision. So this is the bottom-up model as well as a top-down model that we have evolved, and this helps because we have faculty from different specialties visiting all our secondary centers. We also have a very good diagnostic van roaming around in the three states, which is known as Pashyantu. The van has got diagnostic equipment on it, and it enables these patients to get care, uh, to get diagnostic tests done, to get investigations done without having to come to the tertiary centers. And so when the f uh, faculty go there, they're able to you know, treat them for the conditions that they would otherwise have had to travel for. So over the years, we've evolved into these 10 functional arms, patient care, eye banking, vision rehabilitation, education, capacity building, rural and community eye health, 
research, technology innovation, product development, advocacy, policy, and planning. I'm not going to go into all of them, but some of them. And uh, when you look at the impact that we have created over the last uh, 36 years or so, um, we have impacted the lives of 36.89 million people till now. We've been able to reach them. And um, we have been able to you know, do corneal transplants. About 77,000 corneas have been utilized for transplantation. Uh, we have got four, over 4,500 publications to our credit. And the numbers are just mind-boggling. We've also been fortunate to be recognized for the kind of work that we do in various fora. But what is different? And you see all these pictures of people here receiving some kind of care. These are all patients who have visual impairment, who are incurably blind. And usually when they have visual impairment for which there is no cure, usually things stop there in an eye hospital. But in LVP, it doesn't stop. It goes further. The next step. What is the next step? We're able to rehabilitate these patients. We're able to show them there is life beyond their disability. We're able to empower them. We're able to give them jobs. We're able to, uh, you know, enable them to integrate themselves in society. And that's something that LVP is very, very unique for. Uh, education is another one of our fortes. And this is only last year's scorecard where we reached about 4,800 odd trainees. But we are able to train all cadres of ophthalmic personnel, um, of, right, ranging from ophthalmologists to the nursing assistants to the vision technicians that I spoke about and other cadres as well. One of the other things that we are very proud of is the network of eye banks that we have. And uh, we are very proud to say that the Ramayama International Eye Bank has harvested over 125,000 corneas. But what is more impressive is that the fact that this center is probably the largest corneal transplant center in the whole world, maybe, or definitely in Asia. We've also done a lot of research work because we are not mainly patient-centric, but we also are involved in academics and research, and we have a lot of peer-reviewed uh, publications to our credit. But what has made us very proud is the fact that this is Simago ranking that was done by an organization in Spain. And we were ranked globally seventh, the third in Asia, and the first in India for our eye research. And I think that's a remarkable feat for an organization that's as young as ours. We've also been very lucky to have been given so many awards and honors over the years. And uh, the most prominent one that we received of late has been the Greenberg Pri and Blindness Prize in 2020. Uh, besides that, uh, most of us, several of our scientists have been labeled as the top 2% of scientists in the world, which is something that's really laudable. But this is another thing that we're, that's different about LVP. And when you look at this, you'll wonder, what are you looking at? Some kind of machinery. But this is actually the Center for Technology Innovation. LVP boasts of over 40 engineers on our roles who are mechanical engineers, design engineers, optical engineers. And that's something that's very different. You'd never hear about that in an ophthalmology setup. And these devices or these pictures that you see here are various kinds of innovations that have been designed in-house, which would help make the lives of the doctors much easier. And these have been, these are under different stages of development. Some are in use in the field, some are still being developed and validated, and uh, some are under testing. But nothing changes if nothing changes. And I mentioned that Dr. Gulapali Rao had come back from the US, and he had led the organization for several years, and then decided to hand over the reins to the executive chair, Dr. Prashant Garg, and the vice chair, Dr. Rajiv Papuru, and the rest of us are the network directors, along with the campus heads. So this is the younger team that has taken over the baton from Dr. Rao. But um, these values that we have established over the years, patient first, excellence, equity, integrity, and togetherness, which are part of our DNA, these are the values that are never going to change. These are the things that will remain with us and which will continue to imbibe and continue to inculcate in everybody whom we interact with. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Merle Fernandez, for that very impressive presentation on your great institution and what it is doing. <coughs> Rotary is a global network of 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Rotary is committed to the cause of liberating mankind, liberating it from hunger and poverty, from disease and ignorance, and from strife and war. We Rotarians provide service to others, promote integrity, and advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through our fellowship of business, professional, and community leaders. 
Rotary International is primarily responsible for having eradicated polio almost entirely from the face of the earth. Rotary has contributed over two billion US dollars so far to the project and to, to the project to eradicate polio virus from the world. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had donated 650 million US dollars to the Rotary Foundation for this project. The Rotary Foundation is today the biggest charitable foundation of the world. Founded in 1905, with just four members, Rotary has now 1.2 million members the world over, belonging to over 35,000 Rotary clubs spread across 200 countries and geographical locations. Every Rotary club is a unit of Rotary International. The Rotary Club of Hyderabad, which is one such unit, was founded on the 29th September 1949 with 50 members. The charter was granted by the Rotary International to our club on the 31st December 1949, making it the first Rotary Club of the twin cities of Hyderabad and Secunderabad. Our charter president was Nawab Zain Yar Jang Bahadur and the charter secretary was Dr. R. K. Bhandari. All the charter members were eminent personalities of Hyderabad. The club has the unique distinction of having a few presidents of India, governors of states and chief ministers as its honorary members. Many eminent personalities and leaders drawn from different walks of life have addressed our club. Our former Prime Minister, the late Sri P.V. Narasumarao, inaugurated the Golden Jubilee celebrations of our club in January 2000. In its 74 years of existence, the Rotary Club of Hyderabad had undertaken many service projects to benefit the community around it. Adoption of schools, providing them with toilets, drinking water, buildings, classroom and equipment. Regular and continued assistance to organizations like Home for the Aged, Mother Teresa's Home for the Dying Destitutes, and the home for the street abandoned children, construction of the very first housing colony under a slum clearance program launched by the Municipal Corporation of Hyderabad, a non-formal education center, career guidance seminars, exhibitions and personality leadership development programs for school children, houses for Latour earthquake victims, free plots for the families of Kargil war heroes, donations for provision of artificial limbs, a major project of immunization of one lakh children in government schools against hepatitis B, provision of sanitation and drinking water for an entire village near Hyderabad, regular health camps in rural areas, vocational excellence award, distinguished service distinguished citizen awards, scholarships to poor students, midday meal schemes, donations to schools lacking in basic infrastructure, assistance to disaster victims, Rotary Project Annapurna, providing hospitals with wheelchairs and conducting life-saving community CPR awareness sessions in schools for students and teachers form a partial list of our club's executed projects. Rotarian Dr. D. R uh, Rotarian Dr. Rastam D. Ranji, a renowned eye surgeon, was a charter member of our club. Born on 17th September 1901 in Bombay, he was educated at St. Xavier's College. He did his MBBS from Grant Medical College of Bombay University and DO in Ophthalmology from Oxford University. He served during the Second World War in the Indian Medical Services as a <coughs> commissioned officer for three years. He practiced at Secunderabad for over 43 years as a leading ophthalmologist. Dr. Renji was the honorary ophthalmologist to the former Nizam of Hyderabad and consultant to the state and central railways, Indian Airlines K and KEM Hospital Mumbai. Dr. Rastam Ranji was associated with several charitable institutions, particularly the Institute for Blind. He had visited several countries. He served as the president of our club during 1961-62. He was so attached to Rotary that he chose to close down his clinic on all Wednesday evenings so that he could attend the Rotary meetings and to compensate it, he worked on Sundays. He passed away on the 17th December 1973. Rotarian Dr. Rastam Ranji wanted to leave the Rotary wanted to leave the Rotary Club of Hyderabad a legacy and hence conveyed the same to his wife. In accordance with his wishes, his wife left a will bequeathing Rotary Club of Hyderabad a legacy. 
When she too died, their niece, Mrs. Roshni Patel, and her husband, Mr. Minu Patel, executed the will with our club as the beneficiary. When you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, says the Bible. During their lifetime, neither Dr. Renji nor his wife had spoken a word about their benevolent act to anyone. The Patels took the trouble of finding out whom they had to contact to hand over the legacy. They finally succeeded in contacting the right people in the Rotary Club of Hyderabad and handed over the legacy. Not only that, the Patels gave our club subsequently a further sum of 8 lakhs rupees out of the estate of Dr. Rustam Ranji. They attended the first Dr. Rust Rustam Ranji Award Presentation Ceremony on the 16th September 2000 and have been present whenever possible at the awards functions through the years as long as both of them were alive. We miss the presence of Mrs. Roshni Patel and her husband Mr. Minu Patel. The Patel's sincerity and commitment to faithfully executed faithfully execute their uncle's will is remarkable. We, the Rotarians of the Rotary Club of Hyderabad, salute Rotarian Dr. Rastam Ranji, Mrs. Roshni Patel and Mr. Minu Patel for their high ethical values that they uphold, that they upheld all through their lives. In order to per perpetuate his memory and his munificent gesture on a permanent basis, Dr. U. N. Das, the son-in-law of our former member, Rotarian G. L. Narasimhan, suggested that the Rotary Club of Hyderabad institute an award to be given every year to an outstanding professional who has made a significant contribution to the field of ophthalmology. With the help of Rotarian Dr. G. N. Rao of our club, who is the founder director of L. V. Prasad Eye Institute, who actively supported the idea we could institute the award through LV Prasad Eye Institute. The LV Prasad Eye Institute selected the most illustrious and deserving professionals as awardees. <coughs> the, their names may appear on the screen. The next slide, yes. <coughs> this is a list of the people who are the awardees. I take great pleasure in inviting Dr. <coughs> Soumya Basu to formally introduce the awardee, Dr. Vinay Kumar Nandikuri. Dr. Basu, please. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I have the pleasant task of introducing today's Dr. Rustam G. Uh, Ranji awardee, Dr. Vinay Nandikuri. Dr. Nandikuri was born in Mangalore, but since then moved to uh, coastal Andhra Pradesh, where he stayed at various places, finally moving to Vishakhapatnam, where he completed his uh, undergraduation and then to IIT Bombay for his post-graduation. He started his PhD at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, where his work on the signaling mechanisms of mycobacterium tuberculosis actually uh, got started. He did two postdoc stints in the US and returned to India in 2004 to join the National Institute of Immunology, where his lab has been a very prolific one, working on signaling and survival mechani mechanisms of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Dr. Nandikuri joined the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad on the 1st of June, 2021 and has been a very uh, active uh, uh, researcher even in Hyderabad. Uh, I came into contact with him when he uh, delivered a lecture during the Champlain Mod lectures uh, sessions in January this year. And since then, I have known him to be a very easygoing person and someone who is very keen on developing the research infrastructure in the country. His fellows tell me that uh, two of his favorite dictums are that he believes no problem is unsolvable. And whenever faced with a problem, he says that tomorrow is another day. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Nandakuri to the stage. <laughs> and the Rotarians to deliver. Yeah, the question of Dr. Prasad and Rotarian President Roy Joseph to give the University Award. I would like to start with
thanking you all for this Rustam Ranji Rotary Award and I would like to thank Dr. Rai, Mr. Roy Joseph, Rotarian Mr. Sharma, Dr. Rao, Dr. Prashant, Dr. Fernandez and uh, Dr. Bal Subramanyam whom we call Balu at CCMB and Dr. Soumyaga for introducing me, very generous set of words uh, and all the Rotarians for giving me this opportunity and for giving this award. Thank you. I want to keep this particular conversation rather talk reasonably general and so that uh, you know I don't want to lose any of you. I want to talk about research but not going to make it research intensive depending on how it goes. <clears throat> I kind of started working actually on tuberculosis in about 2004 but my kind of interaction with tuberculosis started when I got it, when I was in 1990, when I was a master's student. But that's not the reason I started working on that. <laughs> I had pulmonary tuberculosis, not anything else, and I was treated for almost nine months before I completely got cured, and since then I've been fine. But it made me aware of what the disease can actually cause because I was one of those people who underwent that. The weakness is unimaginable. Even such I was a 19, 20 year old man, I could hardly walk 100 yards at some point of time. It's bad. And then it takes a while for you to recover. The, the medicines that you take are not really the most friendliest one. And the most important thing is that you have to take it every day to get cured. And there are, I mean, realistically never thought about it. I joined for my PhD after getting cured, obviously, but uh, I joined for my PhD in IASC. Never pursued really tuberculosis research other than the fact that I had one or two papers with that. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, no, Mycobacterium smegmatis, easier strain. Went abroad, came back. In 2004, at that time, I was looking for a problem to start my own lab. And that's when I thought, why not work on something which is a problem in India and I know how to do molecular biology. That's how I got in. Now it's almost 20 years since I've been working on this particular pathogen and when I say I'm working, I'm realistically not working. It's these people who have contributed to that. I have given out 15 PhDs. Most of them, almost all of them worked on tuberculosis in one form or other. Most of them trying to understand how this pathogen works. And quite a lot of postdoctoral researchers and few students in collaboration. And this is my current lab that is located in CCMB Hyderabad. I always start with acknowledgement so that I don't forget that. Right? So these are the people who contributed to everything that I have ever done on tuberculosis or otherwise. So what is really tuberculosis? It's not something that is a very new problem. You go back and you'll find it in mummies, Egyptian mummies. Tuberculosis is there for, and there for much longer before we realistically started recording it as a history. And tuberculosis is called many names in many places. You can see it. It's called uh, I mean, I may be pronouncing it all wrong, Pythesis in Greece, tapes in ancient Rome, and it was also called, I couldn't even pronounce it, whichever I tried, I was even looking for it, <laughs> but uh, it was essentially considered a wasting disease in Hebrew, and white plague, and it was called consumption, and at some point of time it was called, it was described as captain of all these men of death by English writer. Uh, this was way back in 1680. People really did not know what was causing tuberculosis other than the fact that tuberculosis wastes you away. At some point of time it was even a bit considered fashionable because you become very pale and, and this was true. I mean, so it was considered a fashionable for a bit to have that pale skin or whatever. But point remains that it is something old, nothing new. and. Till Robert Koch came around and actually identified that it is caused by a bacteria. 
Robert Koch is a well-known microbiologist who is not only German bacteriologist who has actually discovered many things including anthrax septicemia what causes anthrax what what causes septicemia cholera and tuberculosis he had four principles that he can can talk kept on applying for various diseases which is something one needs to understand if it is an organism like if it is a disease and if an organism is present in every case of that disease and it should be we should be able to culture it outside then it's something okay this and then you put this back and it should cause disease in animals and finally you should be able to get the organism back so then that is the causative agent of that particular disease based on these principles he is in addition to other things he has actually defined that mycobacterium tuberculosis the bacteria is the causative agent of tb till then people actually did not know so that's quite some time ago and it's not that we eradicated anywhere and it is still present approximately 1.5 million people they die every year because of tuberculosis even today and i would talk about tuberculosis it has nothing to do with uh, realistically you think that it has got ophthalmology no it has connections which i'll come to in a while problem has been and it is generally been the case with almost all the bacterial diseases is antimicrobial resistance drug resistance and that's been a problem for tb2 it's a bacteria after all so at this point of time in the world 15% of the cases minimally maybe more depending on the place are drug resistant makes it difficult to treat india unfortunately has the highest burden of tuberculosis uh, in the world and that's maybe proportional to our population also but nevertheless we have still have the highest burden i mean why talk about tuberculosis for last 3 years we've been suffering with another pandemic right covid lot of people died how many died around 7 million in 2020 alone 1.5 million died of tuberculosis and that's a yearly count and that doesn't change very much sometimes it 1.6 sometimes it's 1.5 so start adding up covid doesn't seem anywhere near right it's far far more dangerous in the long run than covid that has really did a pretty uh, strong job of doing killing many people in a span of 3 years why vaccine not really very effective drugs they are available but drug resistance is coming up and then you also have the problem of some people don't respond we realistically don't know the reasons if you look into tuberculosis it's a global pandemic you have so many people fall ill from tuberculosis many get cured not everybody dies and then the problem gets a little bit problem more complex if you were to be infected with hiv and hiv makes it difficult for men immune compromised and tb can get activated makes it difficult and 60% of the tb cases in the worldwide are just about six countries you can very clearly see china india indonesia nigeria pakistan and south africa so this is our problem nobody else is going to solve it how do we need to solve it we need to find ways to solve it right there are national health mission on tuberculosis eradication that is set up by our government problems obviously when you are talking about bacterial infection is the resistance to the antibiotics that are given vaccine is still a question mark because it's not very effective diagnostic is not easy when it comes to tuberculosis which is not pulmonary so how does tb actually move from person to person is very easy people cough it starts getting into aerosols gets into the next person when it gets into the next person anything that gets into our body is first taken up by our immune system which is called innate immune system originally adaptive is other things it takes it up when it takes it up tuberculosis is a pathogen that can survive in that it's called macrophages it survives there it does not die and 
instead what our body does is okay fine you are surviving let me at least start giving a some kind of an walling off so you put other immune cells around it and you make it into some kind of a granuloma which is what we see adapt this is adaptive immune response to the pathogen that is there then you reach a point where pathogen can have three fates one pathogen does a better job than you do and it becomes an active disease so your granuloma it starts the tuberculosis in that grows immediately bursts open and starts spreading to other places gets into the blood supply and gets into other parts otherwise you and you are uh, i mean you are very your immunity is so robust that you kill the pathogen completely pretty small cases in many cases you come to a point of understanding live and let live the pathogen stays you're okay that's called latent tuberculosis but problem with latent tuberculosis is there can be a time in your life it can get reactivated when you are not really at your best so in one sense that is actually the problem how to eliminate that residual tuberculosis that sits in your body and you don't even know that you have it and one fine day it is active sometimes you can't even figure out it is a reinfection or i mean you got the infection or is it something that you already had so there are lots of dynamics between you and them i mean the bacteria and our body fight in many ways and they and latent tuberculosis is a result of understanding i feel and that sometimes somebody breaks the promise and gets out and starts making it a big disease that's nothing much you can do but here is a way to so in a way it gets into the airways and then it gets infected so getting gets again surrounded by other things and then either stays there for me macrophages and other things come in eventually or comes out this is the life of how tuberculosis spreads problem is it this is how a granuloma looks image wise and this is how granuloma is from the point of view of a molecular biologist or cell biologist it is the one in the middle is infected cell surrounded by many other things eventually it's a walled off structure i it feel it's it resembles that of a fort you know there is a wall that is built around in between you have heart and there is some of infected cells with tuberculosis right this is how a chest x ray looks right here are the some granulomas that you see in the chest x ray and these are classical pulmonary tuberculosis good pulmonary tuberculosis is relatively easier to treat and it only i mean at the end of the day it is not every person who has tuberculosis has pulmonary tuberculosis 85% of the people or 80% of the people nowadays have pulmonary tuberculosis and they get treated but there is around 15 to 20% cases it goes to other places that's when the complications are a bit higher you can see where and all it goes osteocular tb to uh, uh so you, you have lymph nodes getting infected eye getting infected brain getting infected liver getting infected reproductive organs getting infected and uh, you know spine getting infected bone many other parts of the body can get infected by tuberculosis so how do you treat it not easy first of all to even diagnose tuberculosis that is present in other parts of your body then treatments are generally more of the same i'll come to that too so one of the things is like i was talking to somebody in aims a doctor and they were saying that in certain um, uh, you know in uh, reproductive wing uh, whatever a lot of women actually come to them with having problems conceiving and if they can't figure out anything at some point of time empirical treatment of anti tuberculosis drugs are given and i mean really they can't figure out they can't culture it but eventually nothing else works they give att and it works maybe because att clears everything else but point is that it eventually works after 4 months 5 months sometimes the same women actually end up conceiving it may be other problems too but it works in many cases so sometimes empirical treatments are given based on the symptoms that a doctor sees which is unfortunately because of the fact that we don't have very good diagnostic to determine a tb infection from something else right so here are the various other parts of the body where the infections are right you can see spinal tb 
which is within your spine you can get infection in fact this is what was found in uh, mummies spots disease some of the mummies had uh, the spinal tb that's how they figured out here is a gastrointestinal tb which can be very difficult to differentiate from other gastrointestinal diseases such as crohn's disease because the kind of things that you eventually show up as clinical symptoms are different uh, are very similar her treatments have to be different if you have a crohn's disease that's an inflammatory disease inflammatory bowel disease and if you have tuberculosis it is a different kind right if you give anti inflammatories if it is really tuberculosis your disease is going to go up and if it is crohn's disease and you give anti tuberculosis drug it won't get treated but so sometimes again people come up with a more of an uh, what you come in doctors come up with some kind of an empirical way give them att for 2 months if things change well and good otherwise it is crohn's so <laughs> so it's one way of i mean if you can figure out well and good if you can't figure out eventually you still have to treat these are the things that i heard from uh, people who work on gastrointestinal tb not always easy to figure out and not always to find markers so when you know how to figure out here are the granulomas you can see this perforations kind of a thing and you also get tb in lymph nodes you can you get tb in your brain tuberculosis meningitis and you get tb in your uh, genitals and you know urinary tract this is the one of the urinary bladder and other things this is infection there and last one is the one these are the slides that are given to me by somyeva it's about eye infection and you can see that it is a common cause of eye infection in india and lungs to the eye it passes through the blood stream in the retinal pigments it sits in the retinal pigment epithelium it engulfs the bacteria but it cannot kill that's always been the problem with this bacteria difficult to kill mtb survives in the in, in the eye then what happens is whenever you have a bacteria you will have inflammation that inflammation is what causes your deterioration of the eye and leading to things like this right rare immune mediated conditions uh, triggered by the tuberculosis and you have the other one retinal vasculitis this is also inflammation all these things lead to loss of eyesight if untreated again how do you do it in unfortunately whether it is a pulmonary or extra pulmonary tuberculosis we are talking about very set, set of similar set of drugs when tuberculosis originally started becoming a major issue or where you go back to 1950s before the antibiotics people used to say what was written woodrow wilson's go live in the open is essentially live in the hills so if you have tuberculosis go on top of the hills and there you take clean air and you become better with time and this is this was in fact prescribed treatment you go back and you'll see switzerland had sanatoriums on top of the hills indira gandhi at some point of time had gone there so though nobody would write that anywhere but anyway it's it sums to be that but these are the things they used to send patients to hills and that was a way to treat tuberculosis because you know low relatively lesser oxygen and uh, uh, in few conditions would help you recover better and you you used to clear tb and then you'll come back down right so sanatoriums were on top of hills uh antibiotics were the biggest blessing that we got for treating tuberculosis antibiotics originally were not as targeted you can see that original treatments were 2 to 2 years 24 months later on we came down to 6 to 9 month treatment which is now currently called dots therapy and people are coming up with better and better treatment regimes which can go down to 4 months you may be wondering if it is a bacterial infection that happens to you whether it is pneumonia or something else the antibiotic treatment regime is 5 days if you go to west 10 days right why is this months right okay the difference is the following a bacteria if you take a single bacteria i put it on a petri plate for a bacteriologist and you leave it in 24 hours it becomes a colony there are millions of bacteria in that place and you can visually see it whereas the same thing because a bacteria divides and becomes two in about 30 minutes and some of them a bit later but in about 30 minutes one bacteria becomes two bacteria now how long does it take for tuberculosis anywhere between 20 hours to much much longer depending on the situation and environment
it can it sometimes are metabolically inactive means it doesn't divide very much but doesn't go away and you can't treat something that grows so slowly with five days treatment it's not possible it is growing slowly so you also die slowly because it's metabolism what is a treatment when you give an antibiotic it is inhibiting a process something that cell uh, so that that's something that stops cell from becoming one to two so if you're not going to uh, i mean if, if something that divides in 20 hours 24 hours means you have to give a long treatment and that's the reason one of the reasons for long treatment it doesn't and and it reaches a point where you really can't kill it anymore they are called persisters sometimes because they are so slow in divisions and so you keep on people keep on changing antibiotics to kill some of these persisters and that is also dependent on the metabolic state of the bacteria what's the metabolic state when you're running your metabolism is better right when you are walking it is relatively less now you're not going anywhere metabolism slows down right you don't need that level of metabolism let us assume you're sleeping it's even lower so in general if bacteria can change its metabolic state depending on what is thrown at it what is what where do you get things thrown at a bacteria your body does your body provides the environment and it keeps on trying to kill it and accordingly bacteria comes up with ways to slow itself down and get and you know get into metabolically relatively inactive state so in addition to that there are other factors that come into play what we call as host factor host is us okay you're healthy things are different you're not healthy things are different if you're obese things are different if you are you know older it is different if you're younger it is different and even some people younger can be absolutely in a different state of uh, this thing so host factors are so every person responds differently to the same disease means if you take 10 people and give the infection not necessary all 10 people will respond the same way that's the way we the host factors come into play our eval our metabolism our microenvironment, immune responses, genetic variations of the host, all these things play into how tuberculosis disease as a disease develops. In fact, a while ago I was having conversation with uh, Dr. Prashant and we were talking about how maybe the tuberculosis that goes into other parts of your body may be different from the tuberculosis that comes to, um, that comes to you know, lung. So I was actually telling him that if you have any ocular samples, we should sequence them. No matter, I told this to Somiyave also, that we should sequence them so that we know if there is any difference between something that goes to the eye versus that something goes to the chest. Maybe it has evolved. It has found something that makes it go there. So do we need to know? Of course we need to know. If we understand, we can always treat better. Without understanding, it is almost like uh, with your eyes closed, you're kind of wielding a sword. That's not the same as seeing the other person. So seeing the other person is understanding. So research is basically about understanding what the pathogen does. Right? So what is the treatment for extrapulmonary tuberculosis? As of now, more of the same but longer. So if you are giving nine month treatment for pulmonary tuberculosis, you're going towards much longer treatment, 15 months, 12 months, pretty much like follow it, but it's much longer treatment. It's already a toxic set of drugs. People are not going to really, uh, you know, it's easy, it's easy, no, it's very difficult to continuously take for more than a year because drug availability in the bone will not be the same as drug availability in the lung. Drug availability in the eye is not the same as drug availability in the, uh, say, even lymph node. So every part, we need to figure out the availability, drug availability, and we have to come up with more targeted treatments for each tuberculosis that is there in different parts of your body. That part is something that we have to work on. As I was saying, we have a project where we are looking at this. Not us, in collaboration with multiple people. We are looking at it for what we call as pharmacokinetics. So we take tuberculosis drugs, we give it to rats, mice, and then start looking at different organs of their body and see what is the drug availability in different parts. That way we will be able to figure out what reaches where and how much. And accordingly, the treatment should vary depending on organ. 
where the tuberculosis is suspected to be there. So, is it possible we keep on hearing about this TB Mukta Bharat by 2025 and sometimes the target is 2030? It's not, it's easier said than done, but it is always good to have a stiff target. Stiff target basically means at least you'll work towards it in a proper way. For example, prevention, you need a good vaccination. Currently, BCG is the vaccine. Does it work? Not really. So, what are people doing? They are coming up with better vaccines by adding few antigens to BCG. People are talking about mRNA vaccine for uh, tuberculosis. Second thing is diagnostic. In itself is a major problem because if you have, say, uh, uh, uterus TB or, um, you know, in some other kind of a TB, like liver TB, it is very difficult to detect. Only thing that is relatively easy is pulmonary. Everything else is more and more difficult. So good diagnostics, which is not dependent on the bacterial presence, but maybe the host factors. How do you come to that? We have to work with clinicians to come up with better diagnostic. And treatment. Right now, the treatments are in eight to nine months. You know, that kind of treatment is more cut it. So we have to actually make treatments which are shorter so that people actually follow. And you have to follow the patients to see if there is a relapse and take care of those uh, those kind of things. I mean, challenges in a smaller country itself, we contribute 1.3 billion. It is 1.4 now. So it's kind of a very, very difficult task. But ours is a country where we have vaccinated also so many. So there, if there is a will, I'm sure this is a possible thing to do. And if the government is putting up a stiff challenge of trying to make it uh, Bharat or TB Mukt, ultimately they will have to follow it up with many of these things together. And in, in this it's a complete combination of many people working together, together to eradicate it if possible. So, you know, one of the things that you'll see, when it came to COVID, what did we do? Everybody was told to mask up. Did we mask up? Yeah because we were worried, right? Now you go to a TB center, what will you see on the right hand side? Do you see anybody masked up? No. So a simple thing as you know, you go to a TB center, you should actually mask them up and maybe provide them masks. Simple things will cut the transmission rate by 20%. Sometimes healthcare workers get infected from the patients and this is boils down to a simplest possible thing masking up both doctors need to so having a right kind of wear uh, and right kind of things simple things like masking will decrease the transmission rates among people that's only one of them and we have to reduce the duration of treatment with this duration you're guaranteed that people i'll tell you if you start taking a tb drug it's just about one month you feel okay in about two months, you're back to where you were, very strong, feel pretty much energetic. That's when the problem starts. Now, you know, you're good, right? Why do you want to take next day? So that's where the problem is. And that is when the compliance becomes an issue. So shorter treatments are always better for better compliance. And we also need to do something called new chemical entities or newer drugs. We have to constantly develop. We in the sense scientific community has to constantly develop newer drugs for tuberculosis. For that matter, every disease, bacterial disease. And the third one is something called host-directed therapy. Means don't target the bacteria, but target, target something in the host that is used by the bacteria in an opportunistic way to establish infection. So you target the bacterial pathways, which somehow decrease the survival of, sorry, a host pathway somehow decrease the survival of bacteria. They are called host-directed therapy. This is in the vogue currently. People are trying out many things. And the other thing is what I was talking about. Depending on where the, where the, where the infection is, you have to treat it differently, depending on where the scenario is. And one of the things which is relatively easy is relatively look at nutritional. Tuberculosis is also related to nutritional value of the patient, right? I mean, if they have it, they should be treated with better nutrition. That always helps. And you need to look into their cytokine profiles. That is, gives you an indication of what kind of uh, immune reactions they or immune profiles they have. And that may help us in coming up with better treatments. Quite a lot of it requires work. Find out molecular signatures that are associated with uh, 
person who is non-responding versus responding and try to figure that out and use that as an um, information for the treatment. I mean, of course, avoid drug abuse. It's not about the drugs that we are talking about. I'm talking about the drugs or antibiotics here, right? Um, targeted therapy is obviously one of the things which we talk about. And other thing people keep on talking about is having preventive therapy for the household contacts. You are surrounded by people who are not infected yet. You are a TB patient. Maybe you should put them on a preventive therapy so that it doesn't spread first in the household. Simple things may help in containing the spread of the TB. Right. So basically, why is I mean, basically, that's that's one, some of the few things that we can do. So drug resistance is something that I've been talking about. But realistically, why do you get it? It's a simple thing. You started taking antibiotics somewhere along the way. You stop the concentration of the drugs in your body goes down. When it goes down, bacteria finds ways to develop resistance by doing one of the four or five things. What are those four things? I'll come to back to this slide. I think I should see what are the four things. One of them, drug can has to enter your body and then it has to enter the bacteria. One of the best way is bacteria finds a way to decrease the concentration of drug in its inside. So there are pumps which will push it out. There are pumps which block it. So you decrease the concentration of the drug, you survive. Simple. Second, you get let the drug come in but modify the drug itself. Bacteria can modify the drug by methylation or something like that. Now it doesn't recognize its target. Third, it modifies its target itself. So that now it cannot, I mean it doesn't kill it, but it basically modifies the target. So the drug doesn't recognize the target. So all these things together one or more of these mechanisms and many more which are indirectly contribute to drug resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis infections right so coming back to that if you look into this you see the year of discovery and you see when the drug drug resistance has come what do you see penicillins were discovered in 1928 but the resistance came a bit later I mean, but uh, year of discovery to this, you know, there is a certain level of distance. Now, hardly any distance between discovery and the resistance. It's coming too fast, right? A lot to do with the way we are using the antibiotics. I mean, I'm sure you would know that antibiotics are given to in poultry industry. They are given in fish industry. And uh, they're generally given in many, I mean, people anyway, don't have compliance issues all these things around means your water bodies are relatively contaminated they have antibiotics there when you have lower level of antibiotics floating around bacteria become resistant and those infections start moving around we have problems so to treat some of these drug resistant infection people go back to antibiotics that are not currently in use eventually that is how they treat them so this has been the See, first one with, with respect to penicillin, 28 it was identified, 40 the resistance came. Difference is approximately 12 years, right? Now look into it later on. Uh, something came in 85, resistance also came in maybe 90s. Nowadays it's taking 2 to 3 years at best for the antibiotic resistance to come up. So some of these things that we are doing is always an issue. And TB, it becomes a bigger issue because it's... It's a pretty deadly disease and you know if you're going to have antibiotic resistance then you have your options are pretty limited it can even cause death mdr tb in a person can cause death so it's something that incomplete regime so these are the reasons why it happens so these are some of the reasons that one has to figure out but coming back to the things um, leaving this now we have to identify many things including the host factors there is a lot of research that needs to go in to figure out how this pathogen survives number one how your host responds number two in the clinical setting so time has come really for people who sit in lab rats like me to work along with clinicians and even with uh, you know public health uh, specialist so that we actually have a proper answer for some of these issues so what do i do as i said i'm a lab rat 
at some point of time complete lab rat so i worked pretty much heavily on various aspects of tuberculosis and what we used to do is we used to work with the pathogen pathogen you culture in the lab when you culture in the lab basically um, you know people students can get infected so they work in something called bsl3 laboratory which is essentially a lab where there is negative pressure and you wear a suit you wear double gloves you wear a mask to work with this pathogen challenging task that's why i'm saying whatever i've done it's all because of those students who have taken the trouble to work with this pathogen moreover anything that they do they don't even know the result for 20 days at times so <laughs> it's a more problematic bug to work with challenging pathogen to work with and if you are talking about leprosy it can't even be done in culture so it's a very difficult pathogen to work with in one of the most difficult ones uh, in our uh, among the bacteria so uh, i'll just tell you one piece of data before i shut it i really not going to tell you we also worked on drug resistant anything that i do is not done on my own everything is done in collaboration everything is done by the students we have actually identified I'm going to give only the bottom line that see in our body in bacteria in everything we are always our genetic material is under damage you go out sunlight hits you there is a certain level of damage that happens uv rays not sunlight uv rays in the sun that give you damage and your body repairs it there are mechanisms to repair that's called dna repair without dna repair you will end up actually having mutations much more in our body than otherwise bacteria is also a living being right it also gets damaged so there are repair pathways what we've done we found out is that some dna repair pathways when they are mutated bacteria actually likes it right i mean it helps it evolve and become more drug resistant this is what we have identified using multiple studies genome sequences i'll skip all these slides i'll go to the last one there is no point in um, so we actually did a full fledged, full fledged uh, genome wide association analysis where we have taken clinical samples that's what uh, 2000 clinical dna 2500 clinical dna sample sequences and identified that certain mutations are found only in drug resistant tuberculosis and those mutations of course there are usual suspects in addition to that we found a novel mechanism used by the drug resistant tuberculosis which is essentially mutating its own dna repair if you inactivate certain pathways of repair it helps in accumulating mutations faster in its body like omicron has so many mutations in it right so that some of those mutations are helpful to become drug resistant so it's something that we have identified and this is this is a novel mechanism but having said that there was a chinese patient who was followed in the long term and found to have dna repair mutation before even the other resistant mutations came up in about six to eight months ultimately he became drug resistant faster and anything they were giving he was becoming resistant faster unfortunate it so it tells you that some of these things have directly no connection but they have an indirect connection for resistance it is an issue that needs to be dealt with one needs to do you need lab rats working with clinicians so that we actually understand both ends of the both spectrum of this particular uh, dreaded disease and that is one of the reasons actually from the time last conference has happened at least i have been in conversation with somyeva to find if there is any way we can actually work together to look at ocular tb specifically not necessarily tb ocular mycobacterial infection at large it doesn't really matter what's causing the infection it can even be mycobacterium something else or mycobacterium tuberculosis or not even that but today's technologies allow us to find out what they are and if you have the dna we know what they are because we just sequence them does it cost very much not really at some point of time sequencing a genome was a huge enterprise you all know human genome project at, at some point of time took almost eight to nine years for it to come out in today's world today's day your whole genome can be sequenced for 24 hours 
How now? What is the cost associated with it? Without adding anything else, sixty thousand to seventy thousand rupees. And of course, that is done in bulk. But if you want to sequence a bacteria, bacteria is ten to the power of six bases. Our genome is roughly ten to the power of nine bases, right? I mean, three into ten to the power nine, and that is four into ten to the power six. Roughly, there is a thousandfold difference. For bacteria, it costs around five to six thousand rupees, or maybe seven thousand rupees. So, tuberculosis genome can be sequenced in about seven thousand rupees, and our own genome can be sequenced in about seventy thousand rupees. And uh, uh, when we were doing viral sequencing, that also cost around five thousand rupees. So, it's changed. The world has changed, and this is where we are going. Next generation is all about informed choices and basically trying to figure out what is causing the disease and what is the resistance pattern just by quick sequencing if we can do that treatment options are going to get better and i hope that is where we are and that is where one of the reasons why we should all work together and um, find solutions for this and other diseases i personally believe amr is the next big problem that we are going to have not necessarily covid it's going to kill more people than anything else going forward and thank you once again for this opportunity and this honor and i really hope that something you take home that we are dealing with a difficult disease thank you thank you very much dr nandipuri for the wonderful lecture any questions from the Ask that bit of spitting in our country. Yes, even you know, don't think it band is different, but otherwise also people will just be standing in our people center. They will look over the wall and they will spit. And this habit somehow all over the place. Do you think this is contributing to some of this TB? Everybody is spitting, uh, and there is no sort of. Some innovative thing which people can carry and spit in that. Previously, there used to be at least spittoons. Uh, you know, we see in old movies and all. But now it's like free for all. Everybody keeps on spitting everywhere. The so, uh, answer is straightforward. I would say yes because when you actually are spitting, you are putting out your sputum. I mean, and so the things which are inside, you are giving much higher. Some of these things will become aerosolic, and if you are infected and asymptomatic, you can still transmit. So yeah, it's a problem. These are public, uh, essentially awareness issues, and uh, you know, it's like all these issues are addressable, but you know, it has to come into the public side. Is that why India has a higher incidence? No, I don't think that is the reason. We also have a very conducive environment in terms of temperature and the population. Density of the population is also an issue. You can spit, and nobody is around. Nothing will happen. So, okay, you know, we have a very high density also, and uh, we are a, a tropical country, bacterial infections are always to be in any kind of problem. <coughs> Multiple methods. Lastly, you mentioned AMR. What is that? Antimicrobial resistance. Essentially, AMR is, how <coughs> you may have heard of a lot of hospital-borne infections where the existing antibiotics do not work. And they tell you it is AMR. Essentially, it is resistant to the existing set of antibiotics that are given for it is. And so, what do you do? All you have to do is you start going back to the antibiotics which are not in circulation because they were considered toxic. So, they give some sulfur drugs and some of the other drugs that are not normally underused now as the last resort. Because that is the only thing that bacteria is not resistant to because it's not in circulation. Mm -hmm. Right? So these are issues which ultimately can be a problem. My own father ended up getting a multi drug resistant bacterial urinary tract infection. Eventually, he passed away, not because of the infections, because what happens is when you start giving all kinds of drugs, eventually your other organs start giving it. At some point of time, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it can be an issue, and it directly depends on many many factors, including patient's own, uh, you know, health condition and other comorbidities. <laughs> but whatever may be the reason, 
antimicrobial resistance is an issue. Habits also. Habits. 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 Always, right? Always, sir. That's always the case, right? I mean, if you are a person who runs or even walks 30 minutes a day, they say you are generally in a better position, right? But if you are a lit, uh, person who has sedentary habits, you are obviously prone to, you know, you are not fit. And that alone is not the thing. Then you have other, other aspects which are connected to that, right? Diabetes, hypertension, and many other things. So it's always a complex answer. And sometimes you wonder, people, people with all those things have recovered from COVID, and people without anything have kind of... So it's, it's more complex than what meets the eye. But if you take percentages, habits do matter. Thank you. So it happened with me 50 years back. I was treated with epicillin, they did not work out. Then I was given streptomycin. Then they did go, streptomycin. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was, uh, treatment was so almost six months, six to eight months, so injections. And then impulse granules, at that time it was available. And I was given impulse granules with streptomycin. So this is not very unusual. For example, I had a throat infection, a simple thing. Everybody gets streptomycin. And so, I was given amoxicillin, which is a variant of ampicillin, and a benzene, I think. So whichever way, it went in. After one week, it came back, and it came back pretty bad. Then I went to the doctor, he gave me amoxicillin again, but it didn't work after two days. So we went to something called augmentin. Augmentin is a drug which has a combination of both. Also, it has one more, <laughs> clavulanic acid. So it worked. And again, I went on that for around 10 days. I became better, but it came back. So they gave me one month treatment to get rid of that infection. One month I was on antibiotics to get rid of that. So drug-resistant evolution happens. And the same throat, same infection get recurring. And though I took the full course, so bacteria do actually evolve. You know, the only ones, they also evolve. And uh, they evolve fast. Right? And uh, you know, you look into COVID, you realize how many strains have come and gone. Now you start looking at it. There are variants of concern. There are all kinds of variants that you see. And it will be mind boggling to see the number of variants that have come. The number of variants. And India in itself had multiple variants where the infections were very, very strong. So, about nutrition, is there some particular diet a person with. Uh, see, many of the So when you actually have tuberculosis, one of the problems is also that you lose your appetite. Serious problem actually. You just don't feel like eating. You lose your appetite and in a very short while you actually start losing weight. And when you start giving anti-TB drugs, your appetite also comes back. And at that point of time, if you have something to eat, obviously you will recover faster. And if you have something healthy to eat, even better, milk products and other things. So if economic strata is not really there, providing a nutritious food to a patient who is actually going antibiotic treatment helps them recover faster. It's actually in that sense direct correlation. It's a proportional thing. So nutrition is required because when you are recovering, you are going to eat more, you need healthy food to eat, and that healthy food helps your body immunity, and that in turn helps you to eliminate the bacteria. around so you know it's still a problem but I was telling you 20 percent of the cases 15 to 20 percent of the cases are drug resistant mm -hmm. currently but the fact remains it is the race against time we have to come up with better treatments we have to come up with uh, better uh, ways to 
make sure that people actually take the drugs for the whole duration and uh, i don't know multiple facets will add to it it's always it's not a race you're only worried about tuberculosis it's a race against time for every bacterial infection <laughs> It is a trade-off, that is what I'm saying, but you know, still need drugs to kill it, right? Either your body has to kill it, or the drugs have to kill it. Either you are fitter, or you're, you have to provide uh, new antibiotics, which are not, which are uh, essentially going to work against a bacteria that has drug resistance. For example, for an MDR-TB, bedaquilin is used as treatment, right? Bedaquilin is a drug which has come up... Uh, only drug in the recent past that has come up maybe now there is one more so two of them but these are given if you are drug resistant to everything else means they are not given as a primary treatment they are given last when all else fails so that you have some options up your sleeve means if we are developing newer molecules certain drugs would have to be kept aside as the last option when everything else fails that's one way to do it the moment you put it out in the market free available people use it in fact uh, how many of our pharmacies prescribes antibiotics very comfortably without you ever going to doctor thank you very much i think we move on to the conclusion thanks so much for thank you dr vinay kumar thank you the next project is on the 30th September, Rotary Project Annapurna, sponsored by Rotarian Sukanya Babu. I now invite uh, Rotarian past president Annapurna Shastri to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, for giving me this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks. I think in this audience. I must have been the one who's attended the maximum uh, award functions and orations because uh, as you've seen in the introduction, this was instituted in uh, 2000 and I think I've been a member of the Rotary Club longer than that and I've been attending this oration and it's always a pleasure to be in NV Prasad I Institute for this function. Uh, I think the first person I would like to thank is Dr. Ranji himself for uh, being the inspiration that he was for his generosity in uh, leaving us a legacy with which we could set up this uh, award and oration. And uh, his family, what's to be said about such an ethical family that they had to hunt us out, hunt out the Rotary Club of Hyderabad members to hand over the legacy. Um, Justice Rangarajan, who was on the Ethics Committee of L.B. Prasad, always would say, the will of a person is as strong as the will of the executor. So, you know, the person who execute, if he has the will to execute the will properly, that's when the benefit accrues. And in this case, uh, Mrs. Ranji, who took her husband's wishes seriously, his niece uh, and nephew, um, uh, who handed us out and handed over this legacy. Of course, goes without saying that the most important person to thank uh, is the LV Prasad itself, Dr. G. N. Rao, Dr. U. N. Das, Mr. G. L. Narasimham, who together instituted this award and uh, have successfully implemented it for more than 24 years. Every year they found us a stalwart to whom this award could be given. And what do you say about the awardee? One of the toughest orations is the Ranji uh, oration because the audience comprises of highly trained doctors on the one hand and total lay persons in the form of Rotarians on the other. So either it goes right over the heads of some section or it's too basic for one. But I think uh, Dr. Nandakuri did a marvelous job in balancing this out and making it comprehensible to Rotarians and technical enough to satisfy the LV Prasad staff. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for accepting this award. Thank you so much for accepting this award, for giving us this wonderful oration and uh, for your commitment to fight tuberculosis in its various and i never knew that it could affect so many organs of the body and so thank you so much for your commitment 
and of course, thanks to the audience, the uh, uh, members of LV, uh, the staff of LV Prasad who are here in large numbers, and to the members of the Rotary Club of Hyderabad who praised. And especially, I'd like to thank Dr. G. N. Rao, Dr. Bal Subramaniam, Dr. Prashant Garg, uh, Dr. Fernandez, all of who have spared their time on this, uh, this evening. I know you are all very busy people, Dr. Basu. All of you have spent a whole evening with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anapurna. All good things have to come to an end, and so this uh, evening program. Uh, shall we all rise for the national? जनगणमन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे Thank you. The formally for meeting in the church. Thank you. Thank you, sir.